So, good morning. Everybody awake? No. I'm not. <laughs> um, so, welcome. Um, I'm still Henning. You might have seen me before in this venue or elsewhere. I'm uh, surprisingly still working on OpenBSD. I'm definitely with OpenBSD and sometimes I'm even working on it. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, what I find a pretty interesting use case for OpenBSD. Uh, OpenBSD running on X-ray machines. So, the medical environment we are dealing with here is, is pretty interesting or challenging, depending on your viewpoint. Um, we are dealing with certification elsewhere, but the medical environment, well, it's certifications on certifications on certifications on certifications. Each and every change that is not completely minor to any system involved requires recertification, which uh, is time consuming, expensive, and they try to avoid it. That means fixing problems is hard, and you better get stuff right uh, from the start. Another problem there is the long equipment lifetime. It's nothing like the life cycle we are used to from, from IT equipment. An X-ray machine being installed today is probably going to be there for 30, 40, 50 years. Of course, it will see updates and changes, but it's not the three to five years that we are usually dealing with in, in IT. There is no remote access to live systems. There actually is uh, a remote access to these X-ray machines, but only in maintenance mode. Actually, the operator screen goes red, and the machine is, uh, you cannot turn it on while the remote access is active, and uh, it has to be granted locally. You cannot legally get any data off those machines. Nothing, no log files, no request rates, nothing. Even if it's not really related to medical data or x-ray, just nothing, impossible. Why can't you just sell all the data to Google? Why can't you just sell all the data to Google? X-ray in the cloud, that's interesting. <laughs> x-ray as a service. Let me, let me go, I have a new business idea, no. <laughs> so, um, it's not only no, no remote access, it also is no remote updates. Uh, my, my host, uh, th this is at Philips, so my host at Philips uh, keeps telling the story where he had a little mistake and had to grab the next flight to, I think, New York or Washington to fix it because, well, you can't do anything remotely. And of course, um, that is quite costly and you try to avoid that. Our usual approach of incremental development doesn't work in that environment at all. We can play in the labs, but um, try something out, ship it, and then improve it doesn't cut it in this environment. To make things more interesting, the field engineers that go and visit the customers that are on site, well, they are X-ray engineers. They are not IT people. They are not sysadmins. They will not debug network problems for us. Basically, all they do is, oh, there's something wrong with that box. I'll swap it for a new one. That's the level of what they do. Because, well, as I said, they are experts on X-ray technology, but not on computers. Um, the data we are dealing with here is patient data. Uh, usually, when we talk about sensitive data, the, the most prominent example being used is credit card numbers. If a credit card number gets stolen, well, it gets invalidated, voided, it cannot be used again, and you get a new credit card, fine. If the x-ray picture of your broken arm or your breast cancer or a certain president's empty head gets leaked, that's what they keep calling a medical fact, and, well, that is usually pretty hard to change, especially in the latter case. <laughs> but ancestry DNA, you can store your DNA in the cloud for only $50. Extracting again. What? Extracting again. DNA storage in the cloud as a service. I see where we are getting here. So that's what it is. That's what it is. That's what What's the GDPR saying about that? I don't know. <laughs> 
Well, we gotta read the fine print. Oh, sure, it's, there's a way to make this work. Um, the x-ray machines we're dealing with here, it's everything from, from pretty compact mobile units that are like a little draw, like a meter by a meter and a meter fifty high or so, um, to fully equipped x-ray rooms, basically the size of this room, with, uh, well, maybe half the size of this room, typically. Um, the X-ray machines we are talking about, the digital ones, the halfway recent ones, uh, are technically not X-ray machines. They're digital fluoroscopy machines. And well, what is fluoroscopy? Basically, X-ray is a picture, fluoroscopy is a movie. So you can watch the, um, the joint in motion and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, that covers the X-ray part as well. Inside, there are several network systems. This is just Ethernet. Like nothing fancy there. And these machines have to be connected to the hospital or doctor's office networks. They have to, because of the work, oh, actually, this is a slide too far. Um, that gets further. The x-rays, x-ray machines, uh, consist of several parts. The first uh, is very classic and hasn't changed in almost 100 years now. There's the high voltage generator they need. There's the x-ray tube and a couple of control circuits. The part that has changed is the image sensor. That used to be analog film, and now it's digital sensors. Um, in some cases, wireless, and yes, that's just Wi-Fi. <laughs> it gets better. Uh, there are more components, well, not in the small mobile units, but in the fully equipped X-ray rooms, there's more, more components. There's usually tables, wall mounts, and stuff like that, and all this stuff is motorized. And uh, interestingly enough, the control systems, I'm not saying circuits, the control systems for that uh, have to have some real-time capabilities so that the table doesn't drive off the table stand. Well, they're supposed to be some mechanical block, but they have to have so some real-time. We've just been there. Most hardware these days has been software at some point. So what's the difference? Um, there, of course, is stuff like foot switches, very fancy, and a workstation for the operator. That's how that looks like. That's uh, one of the labs. The difference to the actual installation in hospitals and doctors' offices is that they have the covers above the machine. Like there's some covers missing here because that's their lab. Uh, pay attention to the patient's name. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the workflow there is quite interesting. There usually is what they call a radiology, radiology information system. Um, basically, it works, it works that way. The patient data with the request to x-ray something or take a fluoroscopy of something is being sent to the machine. So patient name, birthday, all these kind of data, and please take a picture of the left, the left knee, <laughs> the other left knee. Um, the x-ray machine operator will do that, and in the end, that record is being sent back with the pictures attached. The radiology information system is there for review of those pictures for diagnosis and for archiving, because, well, this is medical, right? Archiving a lot. As I mentioned, the new digital X-ray machines, uh, the new, di new X-ray machines have digital sensors from the beginning, and that's just networked devices, plain Ethernet, nothing fancy. But as I also mentioned, these machines often live on forever because they are actually freaking expensive. So uh, there are several ways to retrofit older systems. The most common way is replacing the analog film by what they call a cassette that contains chemical magic and some electronics, which after taking the x-ray picture, these are picture only, not movie, um, after taking the picture are being inserted into a reader that through smoke and magic emits the digital x-ray image. And chemically deletes the cassette thing. These are connected via Ethernet 2, 
And in some installations, they are not connected to the X-ray machine's Ethernet, but they are connected to the outside Ethernet network for reasons that I forgot successfully. There was a reason for it. It was something unavoidable. The, these medical networks are strange. For the vendor, another challenge, or actually a big challenge, is that a lot of the components inside are actually third-party components, which means very limited control over them. And, well, for these components, there often is little to no competition. Of course, it's a small market, and there's very high development and especially certification costs, which in turn makes them not very eager to change things either. So uh, this is a nice collection of old protocols. FTP is alive, <laughs> very alive. To make things worse, the inside network and the outside network have to be the same layer two network. Yes? I got really excited about that for some reason. <laughs> because you love bridging so much. <laughs> Please take a fluorous copy of that. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be spectacular. So it's got to be the same layer two network, and that makes things very challenging. Um, but you don't mean external to the hospital. You mean external fun? to the You don't mean external to the hospital. You mean external to the X-ray machine. The hospital network and the inside Ethernet network have to be bridged. Right, but not external as in Internet. Oh, these networks are not supposed to be connected to the Internet. So what you're, saying you're, you're assuming the hospital network is connected to the Internet. So when you're saying inside, you mean inside the machine? Yes. Inside machine versus hospital network. Exactly, exactly. This, is in, this doesn't necessarily mean the x-ray machine is successful directly. On the uh, no. Should. Dirty S word, shouldn't. Um, so we often work in environments where an interrupted data transfer is annoying and you don't want this and the customer has to click download again or click whatever again. Uh, in this case, it, the consequences are actually worse. If the data transfer between the image sensor and the imaging station is interrupted, this is considered bodily injury because you have to redo the X-ray process. So there better is nothing interrupting the data transfer while the picture is being taken or the movie. Um, so you obviously want to shield the internal from the external network. And opposed to many other vendors, Philips actually cares and is doing that. Others, not so much. Um, Philips has had an OpenBSD firewall for that for 10 years already, and I had no idea. Uh, I don't think anybody knew this. Um, it was one, one person, Holger, actually, who's uh, on the thank you page in the end, uh, who did this um, as his master's thesis, developed that little OpenBSD box, shooting the internal from the external network, Worked fine, but it was running, it was not quite 10 years old, but five something, like five years old, and they wanted to update it, and they were interested in getting some of the changes into mainline OpenBSD, and so that's when they got me. Um, the hardware this is running on is a pretty generic, boring, embedded i386 system. I forgot what the vendor was, one of the Chinese or Taiwanese or whatever. It's so generic that it's outright boring. Um, depending on generation, four to five Ethernet ports, some RAM, some storage, like nothing, nothing fancy. Um, it runs Bridge and PF, obviously, and uh, the way they set this up, it is a custom RAM disk, which is a design choice that I somewhat question, but I, at the same time I understand. Because um, especially when we talk about the, the compact mobile units, they are often being used in areas that have very little infrastructure and frequent power outages. So basically, these boxes can lose power anytime. And as I mentioned, um, the cost of fixing stuff there is very, very, very high. So the, that RAM disk contains everything needed for bridge and PF, obviously. Of course, that's the main task. It contains SSH and SSHD and some basic tools, but it's not, not like a full-blown OpenBSD installer. 
These RAM disks have no persistent configuration whatsoever. They have a magic IP address, which is a public IP address from the Phyllis range. They did this right. Um, they all have the same, and which is uh, it's prevented by that system that it leaks outside. So it's not visible to the outside. And the management system inside connects to that magic IP address and sets everything up, including the PF rules and the bridge filters that I'm going to talk about later. So in that setup, shielding the internal Ethernet from the extra this watch up there, which is not working. It's driving me crazy. Anyway, so um, shielding that internal Ethernet from the external one, uh, obviously, PF basically has everything you can wish for to deal with IP traffic. However, this is layer two, and there's ARP. And well, that means IP address to Mac mappings, right? You could work around the, the obvious problems, ARP spoofing, the obvious problems by, uh, um, by entering fixed IP address to ARP uh, Mac address mappings so each and every machine inside. However, I mentioned third party, little control, many components, very flexible, unfortunately not feasible. So we somehow must make sure that no outside system is claiming an inside IP address. Also must make sure the inside MAC addresses don't appear or don't come in from the outside. And that's where it gets interesting. So ARP, that is the specification of an ARP packet, um, which is pretty simple. So you have the hardware address type. Basically, it's Ethernet because nothing else exists, right? Uh, the protocol address type, IPv4, because v6 is different. Uh, hardware address length, protocol address length, the operation that basically only is request and reply, and then the uh, four addresses, two MAC addresses and two IP addresses, sender and receiver. A typical ARP request looks like that. So um, the machine 1001 with a given MAC address wants to talk to 1002. It'll send an ARP request to the Ethernet broadcast address, FFFFFF. Uh, the operation is request. The source hardware address, SHA, is the MAC address of the requesting system. The source protocol address is the IP address of the requesting system. The target hardware address is ignored because, well, that exactly is what it wants to know. And the target protocol address is the IP address of the system it wants to talk to. From this packet, the target system usually, this is, actually, no, this shouldn't be implementation dependent. From this request, the target system, the one being asked, learns that 1001 is at that MAC address the request is coming from. And it needs to learn that, obviously, to reply. So 1002, on top of learning this mapping, replies to the requesting MAC address. The operation now is reply. The source hardware address now is that 1002 system's MAC address. The source protocol address is 1002. And the target hardware address is the requesting system's MAC address, and the target protocol address is the requesting system's IP address, because it's a reply, right? And we want to be able to filter on that. In OpenBSD, as we speak, nothing could do that. Um, as I mentioned, we want to block up from outside that has any inside MAC or IP address in source hardware address or source protocol address, because that's what the systems learn from. Um, but, well, PF doesn't even see hard, uh, up traffic because PF works at the IP level. The bridge filter is the obvious place, but the bridge filter does not peek into ARP packets, or didn't. Now it does. So, um, bridge ARP filter, um, they previously had an internal implementation of that for the last 10 years. That was part of Holger's master's thesis. Um, it was reasonable, but it was obviously not written to be included. Well, I'm not saying this was bad code, but um, when you sit down 
and quickly solve a problem for you, the code looks different than uh, writing it to be included in the OpenBSD tree and being visible to the world. So that's basically what this comes down to. And on top, the world has changed a little bit over the last five years, so this had to be redone anyway. And um, that's where I came into play, so I re-implemented this actually from scratch. Um, the actual app filter is surprisingly simple. This is just about 40 lines of code. Uh, on top of that, of course, you need IOCTL headers and stuff. You need the rule parser for the bridge, uh, for the bridge rules in ifconfig, and that thing is a strange beast. <laughs> Holy crap. Even if you're parsing from a file, it's it's splitting the lines into individual words and stuffing them into argv, argc. <laughs> and then uh, has an array for the individual words, which is limited, or was limited to eight entries, which made some rules work and some not. And <laughs> yeah, so that was an interesting exercise. Did I mention the bridge needs to die? Um, the entire diff with all those bits is still just 400 lines. So this is relatively small. It's more than three lines, but not much. Um, the example views, which is actually very close to what they are running, um, block in on EM0 ARP source protocol address, our own address, so it must not appear on the outside interface, assuming <coughs> EM, EM0 goes to the outside. Uh, the second rule in here, there was the laser here, yeah, um, blocks anything with our own MAC address from the outside. This worked before these changes because this is not peeking into the prop, uh, packet, obviously. And then you block ARP requests with the source hardware address of ours and ARP replies with the source hardware address of ours. These two you can actually combine into one rule. Um, pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy. Did you prepare the diff to translate the rules into the original German? <laughs> Philips is a Dutch company. Well, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> and their bookkeeping is in India, as I, as I just learned. That's because India is so cheap and doing everything five times. As, uh, anyway. So um, there isn't only ARP, there also is reverse ARP, and there was a third thing that is specified but never being seen in the wild, and I forgot what it was, to be honest. Um, reverse ARP works exactly the same. <laughs> Instead of specifying ARP, the keyword there is surprise for ARP. And, well, there we get into this old, new argument. Fortunately, we now have a switch maintainer. Where is she? Ayaka? Not in the room. Damn. Damn. So the bridge is really, really, really strange code. And the bridge code itself, well, debatable. The part that is really, really, really bad is the glue between the bridge and the stack. It's a bit like the original IPsec implementation. The actual implementation wasn't so bad, but the way it has been hammered into the stack is horrible. So um, there's way too many places in our, in our stack that say if they have bridge and then work differently if we are actually dealing with a bridge interface. This is wrong. The future clearly is switch. However, switch does not have any filters right now. And for this project, well, paid work and everything, it was completely out of scope to uh, get filters into bridge or get them uh, into a switch or get them into another place than, than bridge is right now. However, thinking this a bit further, layer two filters actually make sense even when you are not bridging or switching. They even make sense on an IP routing system in some scenarios. So, what I think we need is a new clicky thing. <laughs> I'm using a borrowed one because I forgot mine at home. It's slightly different than what I'm used to, whatever. Uh, what I think we need, and this is now talking out of my ass because nothing out of from this is implemented. Uh, what I think we need and should have are um, generic layer two filters. Um, they should be pluggable or enableable, strange word. On, on any interface, at least any Ethernet interface. And, well, discussing this, we quickly got to, wait a second, we want logging. Last but not least, because the logging in the bridge is very basic, to put it nicely. And turns out, 
logging is a major problem here. And at the same time, PFLog is already there and fits the bill. Thanks to the format we chose for PFLog, which basically is PCAP, it can represent any packet. We could use this right away. So if we are talking about generic layer 2 filters and reach the point where we want to reuse PFLog anyway, there's a lot more infrastructure in PF already that we don't have to duplicate, really. As, yeah, right. <laughs> As of today, PF does not even see layer 2 packets. It doesn't even see anything that is not IP because the entry points are in IP input and IP output and the IPv6 counterparts. And, of course, a special case in the bridge, but please let, it, let us ignore that. Um, so, could we add new entry points lower on the stack into PF? Maybe. I think that gets nasty. We could have rules that combine layer 2 and IP information to filter on. However, hmm, problem. What are we doing with a rule that refers to MAC addresses, which actually is not Ethernet? Because PF works at the IP layer and might see packets on non-Ethernet interfaces. What do we do? What are we doing with rules that want to match on IP addresses and deal with a non-IP Ethernet packet? Uh, question. X-ray machines are somewhat quite old. Do some of them speak non-IP protocols? Oh, this is independent from the X-ray machines now. Okay. This is not relevant to, to the X-ray machines anymore. This is just the observation that I implemented something in a subsystem okay. that is supposed to die. So um, the conclusion from, from thinking about these generic layer 2 filters and the PF stuff is, well, this is very tricky. This is not unsolvable, but it's very tricky. So moving the entry points, especially moving the entry points, is super tricky. And I don't think this is feasible. So what do we do? We could reuse PF code and put it in a separate subsystem. We could put this kind of into PF but have separate entry points that just deal with layer 2. Would we put roots into the main PF conf or would we, would we make this separately? Because we kind of want to reuse the puzzle bits in PF code as well. There's very little point of re-implementing all of that. If we get there, and I think we should, so I'm really asking for people to start attacking the problem. I'll happily really help you. Code. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Weather is nice today. Uh, follow Aaron's example. <laughs> um, if we get there, and if we get layer two filters that are independent from the bridge, this is one major roadblock that stops us from completely getting rid of the bridge and switching switching to switch. It's too bad that Ayaka is not here. Actually, I told her to not be here because she already saw the stock in Tokyo. Damn, mistake. Of course, in Tokyo, she had not been committed to be the switch maintainer yet, and she did in her talk yesterday. She implied, not state. She did, period. <laughs> Both of us witnessed, and a couple of people more. You did too. MPLS? Well, the layers are not that uniquely clearly. What layer is that? Does layer two and a half? Uh, what else do we have? Loopback is not. That's right, wireless. That's not Ethernet. And of course, there's, there's all the encapsulating, the encapsulating interfaces. I mean, eventually they probably end up on Ethernet, but the packets we are seeing inside the tunnel interfaces, like on a PPP or, or a TAN interface, are not VX. Ethernet. Pardon? VX. <laughs> One of the many tunneling things we have, yes. And we just grew 10 more because Gwynny implemented every form of GRE ever seen on the planet. <laughs> Yeah. 
So even if it's debatable whether we have many different layer two interfaces, we, we do have a whole galore of layer two and a half. <laughs> so non-Ethernet is common, even if it ends up on Ethernet in the end. Yeah. It's more common than you care to <laughs> Oh, yes. If we, if we add rules for it, we probably need to add really good observability, because this is going to create weird failure modes that we would never expect when you start putting rules on there. <laughs> so we need some really nice real-time observability off of pipe, you know, tailing something or whatever that you need to watch. Before. Well, I think foremost, we need really good logging so you can see what's going on. Yeah. Having said that, today, if you think about the techniques for dealing with ARP issues, which you know, I've done this occasionally on systems, I, I don't know if we're, how many slides do you have left? Should we yak or not? Oh, uh, almost done. So, like, often, you know, oh, I have issues with, with ARP problems because this network is, is crap, and I need this system to stay this, and it needs to stay talking to this. And so you do things like you end up making static ARP entries on the system and locking them yeah, down. Yeah, very common. And, and that's the filter way is to just, oh, I, I've tied it down, so I'm ignoring ARP. Actually, so can't override it. But, but when you talk about strange failure modes, when you screw that up or when it changes, yeah, you get interesting oh, failures. It's interesting. Yeah, See, the, it, gets, it gets good quick. Another, another case to take into account, these days we are seeing our layer 2 networks getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They are getting bridged over whatnot between cities and, well, fortunately not all over the world yet, but oh, we're almost oh, getting there. <laughs> Miami to Amsterdam counts as all over the world. That's only half over the world. <laughs> but yes, very good, yeah, Australia, right. Europe. That's only half the words, but <laughs> no. But the the point remains: our layer two network are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And especially when we have long distance links inside our layer two network, we want to we want stricter control over what actually goes over those links. So that cries for better filtering. And this is not just IP packets; that includes the up stuff. So I think the case for better layer two filtering is there, not just for this weird, not weird, but this kind of rare, admittedly kind of rare use case. So if we're talking about layer two, layer two WAN links with this, should we be looking at adding some kind of proxy or some kind of intelligence system that's able to help manage this on some other level, leave room for a demon to go in there to deal with large scale layer two networks that would solve some nope. problems that have to be invented? You know, we, we call that NPLS. <laughs> I mean, the propagation the propagation between your LAN and, and your layer 2 uh, wide area network link, there is some kind of bridge in between. Bridge, switch, I mean, a switch is a specialist form of a bridge, right? So that is that point. And, well, that's kind of exactly yeah. how it works. It learns the MAC addresses of our sites and knows what it has to forward. It's not blindly forwarding all the traffic. And switch supposed to make a better job on that than bridge. But our transition to switch is everything but complete. As long as you've got fiber two in the layer two rules, and you've still got BPF that can attach to, say, a pair interface or an ether, you can do whatever you want. Whether it's not here or not. So if you bridge your Ethernet and your WAN interface into a pair interface each and connect those, you can bridge them directly. What's the point of the pair interfaces in there? To have more <laughs> to have more interfaces in the system. If you want to do special processing on the packets before forwarding, you need to have your Actually, just just did something that reminds me on that. That was super interesting. I might talk about this next year. Um, it's basically the box between a 4G network and the internet. Actually between a bunch of 4G networks. And those come in in MPLS and those go out via MPLS, which map to different R domains and you need massive, massive, massive net in between. And it turned out there is nothing on the market that can do MPLS and reasonably do massive net. Obviously can. It's just very, in that case, it's very tricky to set it up, and I think we have to rethink a couple of bits and corners in the way we implemented MPLS there. Yeah? I can almost not hear you. Sorry, sorry. I think what Adam was saying earlier was you have a physical interface, and then you use the bridge to repeat, so rather than put the IP on the actual you know, physical interface, it's 
Oh, yes, of course you can, but... Uh, and I very much hope I never have to do this. You should not have to. You should not have to. This is a workaround for a missing feature. Is it instead of slides, so you don't have to do that even? Yeah. 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 We'll have more time for questions and answers in just two or three slides. I promise new insights, and you will get new insights. My phone has not been obviously tampered with by the NSA or Sevilla. <laughs> My laptop has a puffy growing inside. Not quite finished, but it's there. And really, that's it for new insights. And oh, I added a slide. Availability, because every paper and every presentation has this availability thing. This is an almost, I think in every, but I'm not entirely sure, so I'm saying almost. This is an almost every Philips X-ray and fluoros copy machine. It is being rolled out to their CT and MRI machines as well. So if you Was want... the old one in the CT or MRI machine? The old no, they, they never, no, they never no, no. Out. They are just rolling this out now. Yeah. Uh, so if you want a copy, go see your Philips DMC representative and buy a Philips X-ray machine. <laughs> And if you break your leg, insist that they use Philips machines. <laughs> and see, the irony here is I just had another MRI scan done, and it was on <clears throat> competitor. I have no control over that. I was telling the doctor that he bought shit, but he's like, <laughs> you know, these things come with a seven-digit price tag, and I'm not going to buy a new one because the IT infrastructure inside is not good. <laughs> and, <laughs> I admit I see his point. <laughs> uh, I didn't have a seven-digit number of euros on me at that point. Well, I know nothing about the insights of the competitor's machine. They probably look exactly the same because, as I mentioned, lots of third-party uh, components are probably exactly the same in some, some of them at least. But, about yeah. Certainly, at least. So about your thank you, I, I am impressed that, that Philips actually let you give this. So talk. am I. And, and, and how difficult was that to, to ask them about? One email. Which? One, One email. email. Okay. Philips is an amazing company in that regard. Like, really, I'm, I'm seldom saying this, but working there, um, like we worked in <laughs> there or on their premises in Hamburg, all the employees seemed happy with what Philips is providing them for a workspace. Philips been providing them free drinks and coffee and water and whatnot and open space to spend the time and a good cantina and everybody was happy. And it was, um, it was really easy to get permission from them to openly speak about this and mention that it's Philips and I was very impressed. And I especially want to thank, let me put this quickly, Holger Mikolon, who was my host at Philips who uh, helped a lot, uh, who also helped me with the paper for this talk that I had to write for Asia BSTCon, and uh, just was a fantastic host at Philips. This was really a fun project. And now it's time for everything you ever wanted to ask me, as long as it's remotely OpenBSD related. <laughs> what shirt are you going to wear that I can buy, at the, that buy pictures with you at the auction? I I have not seen it. You said, you said we could ask anyone. <laughs> yes, and I'm giving you the answer. I have not seen it. I also said you can ask everything. I didn't say I'm going to answer everything. <laughs> I have been given a hint. Um, it is related to the opening keynote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which means I'll have to increase the price, so <laughs> fetch cash. Did Philips uh, have any restrictions on the code that you wrote that they paid for? No. Uh, actually, it was, so um, Philips putting restrictions on the code I was working on there. No, uh, the opposite actually is true. They uh, were very eager to uh, get this into OpenBSD mainline code, not just for, well, one, of course, is for their own benefit, because whatever is part of, of uh, OpenBSD, they don't have to maintain. Um, but that was not their only motivation. They really want to give back. 
they, they understand the give and take with open source. They really do. Actually, we were finished a bit early, and they uh, gave me a lot of leeway to work on stuff that they probably benefit from a little bit, but uh, definitely uh, helps OpenBSD. So th they understand the give and take. Um, you said that somebody implemented this before you under OpenBSD. Do you know? Holger, yeah. Oh, that was him. OK. I wasn't sure if you knew who it was and if you were allowed to use their name. Um, is that person involved in OpenBSD at all? No. Or they just happened to he had no, I, I had never seen this name before. Uh, I don't think he ever mailed us or talked about it in, in our surroundings, so we didn't know about it. I was surprised to find that out, uh, find out that there's OpenBSD PF in X-Ray machines. I had no idea. Anything else? Forty-five minutes. Oh, yes. Polishing, foremost. Yeah, there's some yeah, debugging yeah, to do. Switch, yeah, yeah, basically. Peter, do you do you know other blocking issues that prevent us from getting rid of bridge now and switch, switching to switch? Uh, that it's most a, small, a few small features here and there, but nothing really big. Like basically polishing, right? It's polishing. Yeah. Polishing and testing and being, being convinced. Yeah, that's my take on it too. Polishing, testing, convincing ourselves, convincing others. Right. You mentioned last year that there may be a difference in supporting between Switch and Switch D from OpenFlow versions. So there may be some stuff to pay attention there. I don't know the details of that. Is there something that I think we're going to work on? I don't know about that. Yes. So in this case, it'll be local to the machine, not talking to any external controllers. In the classic setup. In the, in the, in the classic standard, the classic standard bridge. In, in, the, in the case of replacing bridge with switch, it's not talking to the it'll, it'll be a localized virtual switch. switch. Not open the switch, but just a virtual switch on the device. Well, it's my understanding that in theory, you could run the switch decontrolling a switch on another host. You just have to somehow funnel the communication between them. Yes, of course. So the, the way they talk to each other is a flow more or less, or mostly, or it actually is, yeah. not more or less, it is. The switch is just a bunch of tubes. Right. Will you be able to support the features that are in the bridge currently to the... Gotta get some pipe fitters and switch gyro for all this. Well, before, before we... Kill bridge switch better has the capabilities that the bridge has today. Of course, of yeah. course. Have to. Oh, this is probably one of the couple of bits that's missing. Yeah, uh, exactly. The thing that the he arranged to go in the RS. Do we have RS? Do we have RSTP and stuff in switch yet? I don't think so. No. I hope not. You may not need. It. Well, <laughs> we, need it. we should. But Ayaka, Ayaka will add this. Ayaka will add this by tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> she doesn't know yet, but she really should come to more of these talks. Anything else? Take advantage of me. I'm here. <laughs> And willing to answer most questions. Yes, you need your smoke. <laughs> well, there's no more questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you for attending.